The Lions tour has been a bit weird this year, hasn't it? Before yesterday's very, very heartbreaking final test in the series, I found myself slightly, I don't know, underwhelmed by the whole thing, which is strange because the week before after the first test, I was feeling over the moon and like we were going to win the whole thing. But as soon as the test match finished, it's just been one thing after another that's just bummed me out. And actually, by the time the third test came around, I thought I didn't even care anymore and was kind of emotionally checked out to the point I didn't even care to watch it live. Luckily, I did in the end, and I'm glad I did, despite the eventual result not going the way I would have liked. But I think I can point to a few reasons why this might have been the case, for me, as well as, I'm sure, a few others. Let's discuss. So first, we have to put this Lions tour in context. It's a miracle that it even happened. Covid to grossly oversimplify has been a bit of a bummer, and it's affecting basically every sporting event in the world, with the Lions Tour being no exception. But one of the big problems that this Lions Tour had to deal with, that maybe other sporting events didn't, is the fact that the whole point of a Lions Tour is about coming together. The fans, the players, the coaches, everyone from Britain and Ireland uniting, and in a lot of cases travelling with the team to play the Southern Hemisphere big boys. But that just wasn't possible. Well, it could have been if they wanted to do the tour over here, which would have been interesting, but hey, I guess it is what it is. Covid sucks, and it ruining sports events or events of any kind isn't going away anytime soon. And with the situation in South Africa when the tour started, which I won't get into here because I don't know enough about it to have an educated opinion, but it was almost sort of a tone setter for this tour and how it was going to be tricky, with cancelled games, repeat opposition, and the South African team not having their full strength sides, and therefore games not really being of much substance. Which seems to be a problem now in the professional era for every nation except New Zealand, who just have seemingly limitless amounts of high level players ready to step up at any moment, which I think doesn't get talked about enough. I know it's boring to just say in New Zealand they are good at the ruggers, but it's true, and they are. Anyway, the point is that this tour was having a pretty rough go of it even before a ball was kicked, and it's basically been fighting with one hand behind its back without the presence of fans to maybe distract from the other elements of the game. Like, let's say, the tactics that were used by both teams. Now, let me be very clear. I believe that both teams and managers were playing to win first and foremost, and they are doing what they believe is right, and we can't really critique them for that. However, styles make fights, and with hindsight, we should have seen this coming. Last time these two managers met, it was in the semi-final of the World Cup two years ago, and they both stunk out the place then. So the on-field product was always going to struggle to excite with these two men in charge of both teams. In my humble opinion, Gatlin likes his teams to play low-risk, high-reward plays most of the time. So if things aren't 100% on, slow it down, set up your kick chase and put up a bomb, either from 9 or 10, and then compete in the air, and see if you can win the ball back higher up in the field. And if they catch it, you should, in theory, have people around it to make the tackles and you'll eventually get the ball back. Now, I've grossly oversimplified a small cog in Gatlin's plans, but I believe that's sort of a microcosm of what his mindset is when it comes to international rugby, and it works. His Wales team very rarely ever got blown out by a ridiculous scoreline. The style of rugby that he likes to implement usually means that you're always going to be in the game, and the few times that I can recall his Lions teams getting beaten convincingly, like the first test of the 2017 tour or this year's second test against the Springboks, his teams are always in the game up until half time, and then the margins of international rugby can be so fine, Daly's disallowed try in 2017, Henshaw being held up in the second test, these little moments define the whole game, and that's the level that these games operate at. One small moment can change everything. A cruel example for two of my favourite players in the Lions team was Liam Williams' chance with the two-on-one and Tom Curry's mall penalty. If either one of those things don't happen, it's a completely different conversation. Warren Gatlin is praised as the man who steered the Lions to three straight unbeaten tours, and he's a genius. And I guess that's just the fickle nature of sport. But anyway, my point is, Gatlin's been getting a lot of stick for the way the Lions played this series. And whilst I have my opinions on how things went down, I believe the way we played is probs analytics-wise. The way with the highest odds of us grinding out a victory. And speaking of grinding out victories, let's talk about the man on the other side of the dugout. Now. Straight up, Razzie is a genius. No other way to spin it. The guy has saved South African rugby from when it was in the doldrums two years before the 2019 World Cup to now being the best team in the world. He's perfected a way to make his team so hard to beat. Then you add on that the best defence in the world and the most physical. He's made it so you legit can't get quick ball against them. Every time the Lions did a hip hop move off first phase, they could never get the momentum they wanted due to the Springbok Jackalers just making 
proper nuisances of themselves. Razzie is a master of disrupting the opposition's rhythm, which is a very good strategy if not the best for the neutrals viewing. His tactics literally stunt creativity and even make me as a fan watching kind of wince and cringe at the lack of flow and momentum in the attack. It's really impressive for Rebby Lez like me, but yeah, it didn't fill me with joy to watch as a spectacle, which I guess is the point. And since I brought up disrupting the rhythm of the opposition, let's just get this out of the way. Bear this in mind before I start, that I believe that this is all a calculated risk from Razzy, but his very deliberate actions on this tour, I really didn't rate it. The Warboy stuff I kind of liked actually, I think it's a unique way to innovate in the sport. Giving players messages personally, I reckon carries a different kind of weight compared to when it comes from your teammate or one of the other coaches. Some people voice concerns about overcoaching, which could have been a problem I reckon if it was anyone else doing it, but from what I've seen of him as well as multiple interviews with players and coaches talking about him, they all describe him as very emotionally intelligent. So. From what I've seen in a way, that wasn't an issue. But the day after the first test, this tour really started to sour on me. I'm not gonna go into the literal hour long video Razzy Erasmus did on the mistakes of the officials in the first test. But what I will talk about is how it just completely changed the tone of this series. It didn't become about the players anymore. It became about the referees and the coaches and I get it. It takes attention off his players, and it's almost a political move to back the refs into a no-win scenario. I know why he did it. It's basically like verbal checkmate. After losing the first test, whilst not actually saying it, he implies that without these hours worth of refereeing errors, that basically they would have won the match, or maybe to put it better, they couldn't have won the game if all this is going on. Couple that with Khaleesi's comments after the game about not feeling heard. He said, quote, I didn't feel respected at all. I didn't feel I was given a fair opportunity. I didn't feel like I was given the same access to the referee as Jones. And there is proof if you watch the game again, you will definitely be able to see. It's just bad vibes all around. And I would 100% say the same thing if it was a Lions player or coach doing the same things. I know I'm not the most unbiased source when it comes to talking about this because of who I'm obviously a fan of, but this is just crap. Refs make mistakes, it happens, it's just how it is. This game, as I've said many, many times on this channel, has too many rules and refereeing is an art form. There are so many things happening at once. You just have to do your best with what you got, which I'm sure Razzy and Sia already know, and this is a very calculated move. Warren Gatlin did something similar before the first test, pointing out the nationality of the TMO, which may have actually been the catalyst for all of this, for want of a better phrase. Crap. It might not have been to the same scale, but if you had asked me, would Razzy's video have happened without Gatlin's comments about the TMO? I'd probably say no. But anyway, all of this crap led to all the media coverage being focused on the wrong things. I know it wasn't 100% of it, but as a fan it just felt like we were just constantly getting lost in the technicalities of the sport, which in my opinion is literally the worst part of it. It all became about the questions like, is Razzy out of order? Is Gatlin out of order? Were the referees out of order? How did the referees handle the game? And don't get me even started on that Jako Johan shite. This game's supposed to be fun. And you know what? I reckon all of this hubbub could have been spun to make it funny if there was at least entertaining rugby being played. Like, the first test was I, but I think only if you're a rugby fan. It was brutally compelling, but that's it. The second test was a slog. And the third was actually okay, but slowed down so much, like the second, because of the rest being so nervous and having to be so sure about every little call that they make. The whole thing just became a bit joyless for me, to be honest. I wish I was talking about the likes of Finn Russell, Robbie Henshaw, and Mario Toje, and how well they played on the tour, or how many Scottish players played in the Test Series, but everything moulded together just made it a bit sour. Couple that with all the injuries, which I guess in games this intense, it happens, with Finn Russell's injury being one of those ones where I look back on that second test like if he was on the bench chasing the game, that could have been fun. But anyway, in conclusion, I don't want to hear anyone saying that this tour didn't matter as much as previous ones, if anything it mattered even more. It's just a shame that this tour will be remembered more for the off-field stuff rather than stuff on the field, because I want to be recommending watching this sport to new people, and this was a big event. but. What I saw, I can't recommend that. And it's unwatchable if you don't already like rugby. And that's a problem. Okay, I'm done talking. Congrats to the South Africans. I have like proper hateful respect for you guys. You have broken my heart twice in two years. And if Cheslin Colby wasn't so 
Good. I'd be cursing him with the dark arts as we speak. Anyway, stay safe. Sign, NGJ.